Um, great to Sorry. great to be with you all. I would say my favorite, and you know, it's funny. I mean, I I think this is a treat, even though it's a little bit savory and it's a little bit more meal like. But my favorite thing in the winter as a winter treat is hot pot. Um, I love hot pot. Uh, I have a hot pot at home. I try to I throw a hot pot party once a month for <laughs> friends to come in. You know, with the fish balls and different kind of meats. Um, so yeah. Um, that's that's my treat. It's it's a nice warm treat um, for uh, for the cold. Love it. Pass it along. Oh, did you mute yourself? Oh, I was trying to. Be, <laughs> I was like, I was like etiquette. Now, um, I'll pass it along to Helen. Thank you, Brian. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, for the folks that I don't know, I'm the executive director for NPower New York and NPower New Jersey and joined by two colleagues today. So I have a new favorite treat. I just had it a week ago, probably for the first time in a long time, but it's an adult treat. It is hot cocoa uh, with marshmallows and rum, and it is phenomenal. <laughs> and it kills two birds with one stone. It kills your sweet tooth and your after, after dinner drink, but it also has that nice... Um, alcohol in it so it gets you a little bit buzz in the sweetest way possible and it is my new favorite winter treat nice and I will pass it on to Debbie thank you Helen um hi good afternoon I am Debbie Roman I am the managing director for Perscola's New York um, I've been in this role almost four months now so I had to change my narrative there um, excited to be here in this conversation, excited to be in this role and working closely with Ryan, uh, Brian in, this, um, in, in these initiatives. Um, I would have to say I was debating on two things. I am from Puerto Rico, born and raised, so I do like my pernil or pork shoulder well done with the cuerito. Um, so that for me seems to be, um, I am known in my family for thanks to my dad to be doing that very well. I started with a five pound and the last one I made was like about 16 pound pernil um, for a big party. So my favorite thing to do over the holidays. But then I thought about, hmm, everybody's talking about sweets. And I say my sweet, uh, my favorite sweet is the churros. Um, mm. So I have a very interesting combination there. <laughs> so um, that's yeah. a winning combination. <laughs> I know, right? You got the pernil and then you got the churros. You can't go wrong with that. Perfect. <laughs> and nice. then I will pass it over to um, Megan. Thank you. I could sense that you're going to call on me. Also, I love churros too, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to steal the same one. I'll say something different. So I'm Megan Marshall. I'm the manager of work solutions at Jobs First NYC. Really excited to be here with all of you guys today. And I'm going to choose two things because I can't choose. So winter time is the time of all things peppermint. And I love all things peppermint, peppermint mocha, hot chocolate with some peppermint schnapps I'm looking at you Helen <laughs> all those peppermint things I love and then um my partner is from Hawaii and he says like one of this is like a big Hawaii snack uh is popcorn with leaving mui, mui powder all over it it's like a dried plum powder so it makes this like sweet and savory salty snack and we make he makes a big bowl of it while we cook and relax during the holidays and I end up eating more of that than the actual dinner. So I love it very much. <laughs> so that's mine. And I will pass it off to Kim. Well, uh, thank you for making me hungry. Uh, <laughs> I, so uh, Kim Mitchell, and I'm the Vice President of Strategy and Engagement at Empower. And um, I look forward to this conversation. I, I did share with Carrie that I'm going to have to sign off at four. So I apologize if it's from in, of the middle of somebody's amazing sort of commentary. Um, I am all things food and cooking. Um, so this is a hard one for me. But I think what I have discovered is my new favorite thing to make, both for Thanksgiving and Christmas, are stuffing muffins. And so in addition mm -hmm. to, or instead of stuffing your turkey, 
Um, uh, we have, you know, people's diets are changed now. So there's gluten for years and there's some that are meat or whatever. But I discovered this combination of stuffing muffins, which is a French baguette and cornbread and a sage sausage and onion and celery with some fresh sage and stock and an egg and butter. And you Yum. then mix it together and you scoop it and you put it in your muffin pan and you bake them and so that you have more stuffing but in bite-sized pieces of muffins and it takes on all of the savory flavors of uh, the stuffing that you put in your turkey. Yum. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see now who's left over? Allison, did you go? I haven't gone yet, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Allison Bay. I'm the manager of evaluation and learning for Jobs First NYC. I've been on the team for about seven months now, maybe eight. I'm getting close. Um, I'm originally from Dallas, Texas, and I was sharing with the with my Jobs First team recently that our kind of holiday treat that is it. There's no good reason why it's tied to the holidays. It's just when. Our families made it, especially my husband's family, um, goes pretty hard on this and uses those cookie tins to, to store this little treat in. Uh, but it's called Texas Trash and it's like a kind of like a roasted spicy Chex Mix kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. it's just kind of out and we, you know, munch on it as we are doing all the other holiday things. So I'll be making that this weekend. Definitely um, need that. Yeah, I'll I'll find one and share it. Um, let's see who's left here. The Aslan, I think, is the yes. yes. Okay. I have kind of a hard name, so I I, I was expecting to go last anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but hi everyone, my name is Tiaslan Batista. I'm the director of uh, partnerships and placements at uh, Empower New York and Empower, Empower New Jersey. Uh, very excited to be here. This is my first uh, meeting with Job First NYC. Um, my favorite holiday tradition, I have to say, I, I was a little torn between this one uh, and not to bring back the libations, right? But there, there, uh, there, there's Coquito which is a, um, it's a version of eggnog that the, that doesn't have any eggs, but that the Puerto Ricans and Dominicans have perfect, perfected. And so that is just like, it always hits a spot, but it's like, I only consume it. I, I actually believe it only gets made like at a certain time of the year. It's, it's not available for the whole year. And so, um, yeah, that will be mine. Nice. That's great. And I think Marjorie joined us, but she has been sick. Marjorie, do you want to say hello and share your favorite wintertime treat? Oh. Oh, there you are. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, my voice isn't too good. I have... Um... <clears throat> Covered from the flu. <laughs> um, my, I, I wanted to come and say hi to everybody um, and say happy holiday um, and jump off camera back. Um, Carrie just made me put some lipstick on. <laughs> <laughs> um, my favorite winter food. Yeah, treat, holiday treat, treat, winter time treat, whatever. Well, you know, I'm from Jamaica. My family's from Jamaica. And um, rum cake, my favorite <laughs> winter <laughs> of holiday uh, food. It's, you know, uh, there you go, um, Daniel. Um, so, you know, it's, it's that time of the year when we put all the spices in and we put the, the alcohol on the cake, it's really soak it very well. And you eat it in small pieces so you can stay sober. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's Thank my favorite winter holiday. Thank you, Marjorie. 
Um, if you need to pop off, that's fine. We understand. Hello, um, everybody. <coughs> all right. So let me go back to sharing the screen um, and do a quick agenda review. Okay, so our agenda for today, um, we're going to set the pace for the network's implementation and gain your input and agreement and do a brief summary of what we've heard from all of you to date and ensure what, that what we're reflecting back uh, seems right. Um, and still resonates with you all. And we're gonna do an overview of Jobs First NYC's impact <laughs> framework and measurements um, that Allison Bay is joining us to do. And um, that's gonna lead into a brainstorming activity using that framework and everything that you have told us so far um, to start setting potential metrics and activities and outputs for our work. How does that sound to everyone? Can I get a thumbs up? Awesome. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit to discussing what it means. Um, you've heard us say implementation plan a couple of times. You've seen it in MOUs and other documents we've sent. What does that mean to Jobs First? Uh, so it means a lot. <laughs> and we're going to review what that is. Um, our work solutions at Jobs First NYC are designed to identify, design, and advance practices and policies that achieve better outcomes for employers and workers. And all of this is a roadmap and a, a view to the Jobs First NYC process and what, what partnership means. It's, it's a lot more than just a handshake agreement. That, not that handshake agreements aren't important. Um, but this is very intentional partnership and, and outcome. So an implementation plan um, includes a three-year plan and budget, logic model, theory of change, a service delivery model, and governance documents. And why are we doing these things? Um, as many of you know, we launched green and healthcare sector networks, and now we're working with you over the next two months to draft that implementation plan and have a draft by mid-January because there is an investor interested in supporting our work together and supporting a citywide collaborative in, in the tech sector on um, really to advance our goals, accomplish our goals and advance them. And our goal with you is to get their feedback on a draft plan and work together to finalize that plan by March so that we can be eligible for their um, funding cycle. And just to, to do the work together that we want to do, right? We put a set of goals together and how are we going to accomplish them? And um, so by March, producing that final plan, and I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail what that includes. So um, an implementation plan, and if I'm going too fast and you wanna raise your hand, just actually come off mute since I'm working two screens, I might not see you raise your hand. So just be like, hey, Carrie, that's fine. Um, so an implementation plan is a plan for achieving our mission created by you, and it includes a statement of need, our partnership goals, a representation of a service delivery model, meaning how we'll work together, I'll define that a little later, um, and our intended outcomes, governance structure, staffing needs as a partnership, do we need a, you know, a coordinator or a director or whatever that looks like, and related project timeline budget to do it all, right? Collaboration costs money. Uh, logic model and or theory of change. Some partnerships do one or the other, some do both. A logic model is a roadmap for a partnership to achieve its vision and is important for many reasons. Uh, obviously, you need that roadmap to do what you set out to do. Uh, it, it provides a work plan, language for us to convey what the network is, what, what the impact we will have working together and what's why we've been coming together as a tech sector network um, for several months we've agreed what how, what we want to do we have a set of goals and so it's a logical sequence that shows how how we will intervene and do um, if we provide x the result will be y and the theory of change kind of zeroes in on the how a service delivery model, um, we use that term a lot internally. It's kind of a, a blueprint or a graphic model of how do we work together? Are there um, organizations that just recruit and refer? Are we each training in something different? 
Um, do we partner, you know, for advancement strategies, retention strategies? What does that look like? What does that model of working together look like? And the governance documents that we usually refer to um, are principles of operations and an MOU. A principles of operations really outline how we work together, uh, member, what, what it means to be a member, how do we make decisions, um, when do we meet, why do we meet, are there working groups to accomplish our goals, all of that is kind of in that principles of operation. And then MOU, you all know, I'm sure, a memorandum of understanding is the thing we sign and say we're doing this together. Um, describes the terms of that uh, arrangement between Jobs First, you all, um, most of you have signed one as part of this work now. And that's a lot of things, so let me pause and answer any questions. Uh, I could stop sharing my screen so I could see you all. All that straightforward or any anything you want to dig in on? There's opportunity to later if something comes up. All right, good. Sounds like that was clear. Um, and I lost my agenda. I think uh, if there are no questions at the moment, Megan, why don't I pass to you and you could kind of recap people on where we've been. Sure. And where we're going. Are you able to uh, share screen again or did you lose the... Nope, I got it. Hold on. Can you see? I can see. Can hey. you all? <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So, yeah, as Carrie mentioned, we just kind of want to quickly reflect back, you know, who are we? What are we doing? What have we heard from all of you so far? And what does that mean going forward? Um, so reflecting back to all of that to you, this kind of synthesis or summary that I'm going to walk through is pulled from the Good Jobs Challenge that some of you may be familiar with that you submitted information on, as well as some past meeting notes um, from previous months of work together. So that's kind of where this information and ideas and goals and whatnot is coming from. Um, so we're going to quickly look at, you know, the types of organizations that are represented here in our network and the populations that we're serving. Um, we're going to talk about some resource needs and challenges that you've all reported um, your organizations, you know, face or that your participants face or that you need. Um, and then finally, we're going to move to the interests and goals the group has set forth um, in previous sessions. So let's who are we and who do we serve, right? So currently the types of organizations in our network are all workforce developers training in tech, as you all know. Um, and on average, it's, we serve individuals from underserved communities, from diverse backgrounds across New York City, a large majority of which are young adults. Um, and the neighborhoods we serve are vast across New York City. So communities like South Bronx, Harlem, Washington Heights, Bed-Stuy, East New York, and more are all represented in our orgs that are here in the network with us today. And based on what we know of your programs and what you've told us and what we've talked with you about, the network organizations offer training in some tech fundamentals, software engineering, cybersecurity, cloud computing, and IT support, and all, all good tech things. And the most common job title that we found in our notes was software engineering. So that's just a fun little tidbit there too. Next slide, please. And if there's something we left out off that you train in, just put it in chat and we'll make sure we get it on the list. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, and moving to the challenges and resource needs that you've all reported to us, uh, you stated that the challenges your participants face and or resources needed to address certain challenges include, but aren't necessarily limited to, um, healthcare, financial assistance, public assistance, childcare, digital access, and some various skills gaps. And again, as Carrie mentioned, if there's anything that pops up as I'm talking that you're like, you know, we need to really flag this thing, it's not represented here, please drop it in the chat and we can also pause after I go through these to talk about it further. So I'm gonna to go to the next, oh, back one, please, thank you. And the most frequently reported organizational-based challenge expressed by the group revolve around recruitment and funding were the top most reported based on our notes. And then some of you all mentioned diversifying and deepening your employer relationships as well. 
and some res some strengths that you've all reported. Uh, funny enough, is relationships with employers. So maybe the previous challenge is we have those relationships, but we need to cultivate them further in some capacity. Um, there's also reports on your strong pr training programs. And another org specific strength mentioned uh, from one particular group was the Knowledge House's resume book that's used for employment placement processes. And they reported some really good outcomes from that tool. So we wanted to highlight that and thank them for sharing that with us too. And moving on further, um, looking back at some of our previous conversations and pulling out little tidbits, um, some areas of interest and tools and experiences and things like of that nature that you've all expressed interest in, in leveraging or exploring further are collective RFPs and collaboratively navigating some local, state, and federal funding opportunities, developing data tools and collective outcomes, tracking mechanisms, conducting qualitative interviews with employers or focus groups of some kind, creating digital resources like a virtual resource library or an alumni career portal, discovering opportunities for building or scaling apprenticeship programs, um, hosting an employer-sponsored hackathon events, building community among students and alumni. Someone mentioned the use of Hunter as an effective job searching tool. And then a few others are creating common assessments for cross network referrals and making this network a results oriented coalition. So those are some of the like interests and different things that have been mentioned over previous months of meetings. And then finally, in previous meetings, we've identified together as a network some priority interests and goals and we work to kind of categorize these, streamline them and rank them in priority order. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm just gonna read quick quickly through those. Um, strengthen collective mechanisms to negotiate with employers and community colleges for articulation and matriculation agreements. Organize and expand customized training and upskilling across tech skills training providers to meet demand and be seen as a go-to source for talent. Systematize or digitize a network referral system to scale training and increase upskilling opportunities to bolster the talent pipeline. And finally, the last one was establish how skills-based hiring versus degree requirements results in equal or stronger candidates and employees. So that's kind of a brief overview of things that we've heard from all of you um, in our previous work together. And we'll continue refining some of these items as we brainstorm what we'd like to implement as a network and how, but these synthesized ideas we're sharing back to you as kind of a jumping off point to get us started and thinking about how we can make some of these goals and interests a reality as a collaborative effort. So I'm gonna pause there and say, open the floor to say, how does all that sound? Am I hearing things correctly? Does any of this not resonate with you? Any gaps? What's, what's your thoughts? on all of that good stuff. And if it sounds great, I'll take a thumbs up too. I have I have one question and just a clarifying question, not to assume, uh, given that this is my first meeting. When you mentioned the top three resources um, for nonprofits, you mentioned obviously the recruitment and the funding. Is it the assumption that within the funding then would be the staff resources? Because it wasn't itemized in one of those. And I think that as a nonprofit, or um, it's important to, yes, the funding will cover for us to deliver the, the program, but the staffing is also the challenge on our end to have enough staffing resources to be able to deliver this. Yeah, I think that the funding was, a word that was kind of like a, a streamlined thing where it could it could attach to a lot of different things. Um, and I think that I hear you loud and clear that some of the staffing issues within your own organizations is a challenge. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, I think that being able being upfront about the fact that yes, the funding will support the support of these individuals and it comes with the utilization of those fundings to hire more staff to be able to, to do our work. Yeah. Carrie, did you have anything you want to speak to on, on that front too? Um, I think more of a, a clarifying question for your clarifying question. Um, are <laughs> you so I just want to 
reiterate that this is we're sharing back um, in conversations that we've had with with this group um, in prior months, some of the challenges that were mentioned broadly, not necessarily to collaborate in in this structure here, just challenges in delivering tech training programming as individual organizations, like the questions came up, like what are your greatest challenges in doing your work? One of the things, the number one thing that came up was around recruitment, which kind of went up and down with COVID um, that fluctuated of, of that being the number one. And then funding as an organizational reported challenge and then diversifying employer relationships, I think probably connects to the up to ups and downs of the sector too. Um, so it sounded like to me, Debbie, that your point or your question might be more around funding or resources to collaborate in a, in a structure like this, as opposed to do your own work, or am I hearing wrong? Well, you did mention that at the beginning where you are looking to seek funding specifically to identify potentially a coordinator or someone that will support the coalition and the network to be functional. But what I'm trying to what my question relates to is in regards from the nonprofit delivery um, that um, that's delivering the training per se. There will there are some challenges to have enough staff to be Mm -hmm. able to scale up or serve more or reach out or it will fit into one of these regardless like if i'm talking about recruitment well then i need more staff for recruitment to get out there in addition to the coordinator that's working with all of us jointly Um, that that is where i'm coming from is being able to identify from the from the side of the nonprofit um, to be able to deliver the services Yeah, great question and great points. And I think um, what I would say is what you're stating, partnerships reflect in a budget. When when they put together a plan and put together a a collaborative or network budget, it's a a budget that includes all of those things. So the recognition of if let's just use a you know random example as a network we decide in the first year of functioning together as a network we want to serve together 100 more people than each of us served last year individually so on top of each of us say we want to serve 20 more people next year let's just say to do that i need somebody who is able to assess and refer people differently, me, you know, at Perscolis or me at Empower or me at whatever organization. So that would be part of the budget saying, okay, if, if my organization's going to serve 20 more people that either we refer out or get referred in, what does that take in terms of capacity for more my organization? And yeah, Makes that sense. would be written into the design, the plan and the budget. Okay, yeah. thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Sure. Thank you for the good question. Anybody else? Yeah. Cool. Well, if nobody else has any clarifying questions or additional thoughts for the moment, let's keep on trucking and keep the momentum going. Yeah. So if that's cool with you guys, we're going to kick off the next aspect of our session to start thinking about how we can start organizing ourselves towards that collective impact. Um, So I'd like to pass the mic to Allison Bay, Jobs First Manager of Evaluation and Learning, to briefly walk us through Jobs First NYC's impact framework, um, evaluation targets, and ideas for metrics. We'll then use what she shares with us to guide a brainstorming activity where we'll focus on some measurable activities this partnership could potentially engage in as we work towards that network implementation plan. So we'll take what I reviewed, what Allison's going to share, and start making some action plans around all of those ideas. So with that, Allison, I will pass the mic to you. Thank you, Megan. Um, Well, thanks all for letting me join today. It's great to um, meet you all and see a couple of faces, uh, put some faces and names together. Um, So I'm happy to be here. Um, If we can move on to uh, the the first slide here, Um, I just want to introduce first our impact framework. 
um, our impact framework at Jobs First NYC guides not only how we track our success as an intermediary, but it also informs how each network like this one can think about, frame and measure their own outcomes, goals and efforts. Um, so for you all as the tech sector network, um, this framework describes four areas of impact that your collective work can achieve. What's key about this impact framework is that at the end of the day, it's really all about people. Um, each of us is here because we want people to have better jobs, more economic success, uh, to have more fulfilling lives. So as we look at each of these four areas, um, just keep in mind that success in any of these areas really does equal better outcomes for people. And this can occur through direct services as well as through larger change measures, um, which we know is why many of you have joined a network like this one or participated in um, another Jobs First NYC solution. You'll also see here in these boxes um, that we have a few guiding questions in the framework that are intended just to inspire your outcome development as you all work together. So in the next slide, um, we'll look at, um, or maybe one back, I think. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, the people level is the most direct level of impact. Um, some of the indicators that we try to measure across all of our work are questions around job placement, credentials, training completions, et cetera. And you'll also notice uh, that we specifically disaggregate young adults because it's uh, connected to our mission at Jobs First NYC. Uh, but your network may determine something more broad. Um, we just want to ensure that we capture those explicit goals. Um, on the next slide, we will, uh, you'll see some things around partnerships, what we measure there. Um, we like to measure how many agencies and entities participate in a network, um, how the network members change or adapt because of their participation. Um, also looking at things like the visibility of the network in the broader space. Um, so those are some things that we measure. Um, on the next slide, we are looking at institutions and institutional change. Um, this is how we think about kind of that bigger level of employers, unions, and other individual institutions, how they might have changed their practices because of our activities. And here on the last slide, finally, we measure how systems are changed by our partnerships. Um, we often see this through new funding or increased funding. Um, engagement with government agencies, new policy proposals or adopted policies, um, but also things like just increased awareness around issues, things like that. Um, so of course, you, as you know, systems change is very broad um, and very difficult to, to really measure. Um, and so because of that, or maybe because of the other way around, it's very difficult to achieve on our own. It's collective work. Um, it requires collaboration, and that's why um, organizations and individuals uh, come together uh, and join networks like this one. So what does this mean for you all? Um, as I pass the mic back to Megan, um, the key takeaway here is how you all as a network um, can start thinking about and specifically learning how to name and measure what you all hope to achieve together. Um, so Megan, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Allison. Thanks for the quick overview. I appreciate that greatly. Um, so, based on what we've reflect what we've reflected back to you, and focusing on the priority interests you see on the screen on the next slide, please. There we go. Um, so, focusing on the priority interests you see here on the screen and that we reviewed earlier, we'd like to have a brainstorm session with all of you around these goals within the framework of the four quadrants Allison just walked us through. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So in thinking about our work together, we categorize those priority goals into the category they best fit within this framework, which you can see on the screen here. So under people, we've placed the goal that focuses on organizing and expanded, um, expanding customized training and upskilling opportunities. Under partnerships, we place the, uh, place the goal focusing on a network referral system. Institutions, you'll see the goal about negotiating with employers and community colleges. And for systems, you'll see the goal focusing on establishing how the skills-based hiring results in equal or stronger candidates. So to brainstorm around these ideas, we're gonna be working together as a group in a Jamboard to consider 
what are the activities we need to engage in to accomplish the our particular goals of interest? And from those activities, how are we going to know it's successful? What are our metrics for success and how can we measure that progress as we uh, move toward our goals? So the goal of this brainstorming activity is to think through these proposed goals and think about those measurable activities we can undertake as a network, all within the framework of one of the four impact categories that we just described. Does that all make sense so far? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Let me scroll through so I can see everybody. Awesome. Thank you for the thumbs up. Um, so great. As we, as I mentioned, we'll be working in a Jamboard as a group or a small enough group that we figured we could all just kind of come off mute and throw out ideas with one another. Um, so on the first slide of the Jamboard, you're going to see like all four of the priority goals just there for a reminder. After that, you're going to see descriptions of each of the four impact categories Allison walked us through, which are there as a reminder. And then there's tables for us to record our brainstormed ideas. We'll do the majority of our work on the pages that look like the example on the next screen. So this is what the Jamboard will look like inside. So you'll see the goal is written in the text up at the top, which is, and, and this example is the one about strengthening mechanisms to negotiate with employers and colleges. First column, how to reach the proposed goal. Next column is potential indicator of success. And the column after that is where we can propose an idea for how to measure that activity and an indicator of success from the previous two columns. And the last column we can treat kind of like a parking lot, if you will, where we can add some notes, comments, questions that arise that we need to address uh, and have deeper conversation if we don't have time and that kind of good stuff. Any questions about that part? No, thank you for the head nod. Appreciate that. Awesome. So let's get started, Carrie. Before I do this next thing, I want to ask you, for sake of time, should we still do the individual work? Um, are we, I think we're a little behind. A few minutes. Um, let's, okay, we'll do it for a little shorter. So people yeah. can get it. Okay, cool. Sorry, everybody on the fly shifting here. Um, but what I was referring to is that we recognize that everyone works differently. So we wanted to give you guys a couple minutes to kind of quietly individualize time to review this Jamboard, check out some of the stickies we've added before coming together to talk through the ideas as a group. So as you're going through, you can add some more stickies as you look at things you know, individually, if you have thoughts, questions. So that'll ensure as we go through that we can work on those questions or address them as a group. Um, thank you, Carrie, for dropping in the chat. I want to make sure everyone opened it successfully. So I'm going to ask for yet another thumbs up if it has been opened. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And does anybody need a quick walkthrough of how a Jamboard works or how to interact with it? It looks like the answer is no. Okay, cool. So like I said, we just want to give you guys some time on your own to read through this, look through it, add some additional stickies if you are anything's coming to mind. And then we're going to regroup and we're going to go through it page by page and have an open discussion and brainstorm. Sound good? All right. So I'm going to set a timer for like eight minutes tops, and then we can come back in and have a discussion. Sound, sound good? And feel free if you prefer to have your camera off or come off mute and chat and ask questions, whatever. I know we we put we threw a lot at you. Yeah. Um, and Megan did it beautifully. Thank you, Megan. Um, but we'll be quiet unless you need us. Let us know. Timer started now.
take another three minutes or so to add your um, stickies and Megan need, needs a bio break. So we'll start when she comes back. <laughs> Feel free to self-break if you need one also. Were you guys waiting on me? No, I think you're right on time. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, so if we could invite folks to come back. Uh, I hear the church bell tolling, so I guess it's exactly four o'clock. And Megan, did you want me to share my screen with the Jamboard or did you want to share yours? I can share so I can, we can trade off the sharing responsibilities. I'm fine too. I have two screens set up to so whatever is easier. Okay. Either way is fine. Go okay. ahead. So I can, here you go. Let's say, I'll make this full screen. Okay, that should be full screen. Awesome. And if you're sharing, are you able to act as our scribe as things pop up? Um, yeah, I could scribe or, I mean, I think if you scribe and I'm sharing that also works, like people just see whatever you're typing. So we could, we could trade off. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Okay, so let me get on the, I feel like I see a lot of new additions on, the first page of organize and expand customized training. So maybe we could just jump right into to sharing. What do y'all think? Sounds good. Cool. I see that there's uh, some new notes in here, accessible job board, comparing notes on what employers appreciate about grads from our programs. Does anybody who wanna who wrote ideas in that first column wanna come off mute and share? And we can just start chit-chatting. Unless we had a couple of people drop off. So potentially maybe those people are no longer present. <laughs> um, so I'll ask a more generalized question. Um, when thinking about how we as a collaborative network could expand tech training, what comes to mind? What do you guys think about what we see here? There's you know, scaling apprenticeship programs, the accessible job board comparing notes. What are some initial reactions to what you're seeing on the job board? I mean, on the Quick question and I'll, I'll share my thoughts. So when we say customized training, um, that means like working with companies to create customized training specifically for those companies? I think it could mean that. I think it could also mean 
customized training based on participant feedback and need. What so for example, another another group offered an idea for like they needed customized training for their students who were struggling to pass a certification exam. This was in our healthcare network. Yeah. Um, so that could be a customized thing. It could also be employer-led customized. I think that's up to you to think through with us. So I think that's a great question to pose. Absolutely. So this is like essentially how do we expand our work and do it better is like it's a very general question. Um, so for me, everything that has compare notes is like what I wrote because I'm like, I want to know what others like, you know, sometimes we think in a vacuum. Um, I'm, I'm always reminding my team, let's not reinvent the real, real reach out to folks at the empowers at their first goal is, um, I like to see more of that collegiality in our space and more opportunities for our staff members, um, to connect so that more and more of this cross flow happen, but it starts with us. And for me, um, uh, if you, in the notes and comments, I didn't really know where to put it, but I, yeah, I think it was a catch all. I, I said, comparing notes on non-traditional models and I mean, in terms of uh, delivery models. So um, we have a part-time program and um, that's one thing that creates a lot of opportunity for folks who are working during the day that need some sort of income. Um, and even then, given that you're working, if you're working part-time, life happens and then you may not be able to complete the program and then folks are asking for asynchronous so i'm wondering you know what folks are thinking about in that space if we're not thinking about why not there are there is and there new there's new camp out there there's four popular companies that are doing it um and it may or not may not be working it may not may may or may not work for our population but it it, it would give um the folks that we serve another option so just thinking about delivery models is something I'd like to offer to the table. Thank you for that. And since Travis Fox isn't here with us today, I'm going to bring his voice into the room because you reminded me of something he said when we got his feedback on these questions about the non-traditional models, asynchronous, and that connects to an idea he spoke about um, having some sort of tool or mechanism uh, based on who we serve, each individual organization, and matching students based on like identities, characteristics, life circumstance, et cetera. So if, if in that referral and recruitment tool, like that could connect to what you're saying, if there is an asynchronous option, I think those two, you just reminded me of that. So I wanted to make sure to lift up Travis's voice while he's absent. I asked him if I could say his name too. So I want to throw <laughs> that next too. <laughs> right, shout out to Travis. So I'm gonna put. So I added the accessible job board. Um, I mean, it seems like if we're trying to get recognition as a network and and attract um, potential employers, uh, I think it, it makes sense if there is a one place where like our target population could go to to get roles that actually they're qualified for based on like our tra the training that they're getting from our programs. And so that's why I put it put that there. But I also saw it down down the line in another slide. So I'm guessing you guys are already thinking about it. Sorry, I was trying to describe and and type what you were saying too. Carrie, I might have to pass the the mic to you so I can take notes a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's already there. The accessible job board. It's the blue one there. Um, and I think it's, I asked them based on oops, what you were saying, um, thinking about this goal, like organize and expand customized training and upskilling across tech skills training providers to meet demand and be seen as a go-to source for talent. Um, I wonder if like, it, it sounds like we're, you know, you're, you're starting with the end in mind, which is great. Um, you know, thinking about like, where do we ultimately want to end up is this understanding like the placements, where the demand is, what the jobs are. And so if we're working backwards from there, how do we reach a goal of being seen as this go-to place for talent, you know, before we even get to the to the point where like we're we're sharing the job orders, and I assume, you know, each of you have jobs that you might not be able to match talent to. And then each of you have talent that you might not be able to match jobs to. So it makes sense, right? Pooling those resources together. 
Um, I'm trying to think about it from like the perspective of an employer who's saying, hey, there's a tech network, you know, not just like there's an NPower or there's a Perscolis or there's a Marcy Lab School, but there's a tech network and my company needs 30 data analysts. I wonder if, you know, this network can develop that talent for me based on my specific requirements for that job, you know, so what is it, what is it that we can do together thinking about how we train people, how we recruit people, um, how we customize training. I think at, for me, I don't know, that's what's like coming to mind first of like, how, why are we a go-to source for talent? Does that so, make sense? Go ahead, somebody was speaking. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to add to that, Carrie, and, and it makes sense. I just want, so my, I, I sort of expanded on that piece that you just shared recently in the accessible job board to connect the dots for that customized piece. I addressed it with the job seeker, but after hearing you, what you described, what everyone has described rather, is potentially an opportunity to identify let's say we get the employers to go to that job board, right? And the invitation would be to place their job orders there. But at the same time, if they find themselves that there is a specific skill set that they may need, that is not there, who is the provider that can get closer or gets to customize that training for them, right? It's like becoming that source where we can get the talent, but we can also get that customized piece. So that's why I wrote there, you know, connected to a list of tech service providers to serve job seekers with training that they may need to apply for that job, but it's, it could be implemented the same way backwards, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of having, you know, addressed it with the job seeker, okay, I want to apply to mm -hmm. a job in X organization or get X company, but I don't have X, Y, and Z, which are my um, training providers where I can go to to get those skills so I can be eligible and marketable for that particular type of job and then vice versa is sort of like where do we land with our employers inviting them to come in and see who's out there who are the providers and how to customize that training um, for them to meet their demand if it's at large scale. Yeah. And again, like you, uh, you all are the experts in the tech space. We are not jobs first. We're the experts in, you know, building a partnership and um, figuring out like how to measure impacts in these different areas for a partnership. So, and some of the, what I was saying came up because we did this recently with healthcare partners and they're seeing this a lot, right? With employers in healthcare saying like, nobody's doing training in X, Y, Z, this, this role that we have a lot of positions to fill. So you, you tell us if that is the case in tech, it may not be. Like you may already all be covering the types of training that you're hearing where there's demand. Um, and so it's more about like coordination than addition of, of new things. Um, but looking at some of the things that you added, like going across the line. Um, so you've got, I love that you've been putting down like how to measure success. What are the indicators? How can we measure that? Um, so thinking about the things lower down here, like asynchronous programming to offer flexible training options. Um, what's, what would be a potential indicator of success for that? Um, so, I mean, the number of students and the number of folks who enroll in those programs and successfully complete and persist into a program, uh, persist into roles. Yeah, and that both is an indicator of success and a, and a measure. Right. And, and you also said then like an increased number of matches to jobs. Is that 
capture the second half of what you said? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah those are separate. Is increased matches to jobs, right? Mm hmm. Awesome. What else did somebody add on here that we can maybe build out across, or or do we have it covered? Yes, yeah, so sorry. You, you can go ahead. No, you go. I think we were going to say the same thing, so I want to hear your voice more than mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I I added a developing digital literacy. Just thinking about the the funnel and the number of folks who um, expanding the number of folks who can benefit from an opportunity like like ours. There are a lot of folks who, I mean, there's a spectrum of digital literacy, like people who don't have phones, and, I mean, who don't have devices and don't know how to use a computer. And then there are folks who have a computer, have devices, um, but really have no exposure and they wouldn't be able to just jump into um, a program right away. Or let's say they wouldn't be able to jump into a program that is not directionally going to lead to a job. Right, so if they they need an experience that probably would be asynchronous or part time, um, that would cultivate the skills and curiosity and interest um, and basic literacy of of using uh, certain tooling, so that they could ultimately go into one of our programs. So just thinking about the top of the funnel and making sure that as we think about, I love this idea. I mentioned the chat. Career Karma um, is for for profit boot camps. Um, and I don't know that, you know, there, there is a definitely, there's a need for the, you know, there's no incentive for them to put a knowledge house of scholars on there since we are free programs, they, they actually make money from, you know, placing folks in boot camps. But if we had something, um, on our side where folks are developing an interest, we put them in little groups where they're developing their, their basic tech understanding, curiosity, and they're getting inspired. And then ultimately they apply, they go through the standardized tech assessment and also maybe other types of assessment, learning assessment, things of the sort. We'll have a more complete picture of who's coming in. They would have already done some of the groundwork to start their journey. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. That's really, um, that's helpful. I'm wondering, it looks like we have, so developing digital Asian is there something else that you wanted to add related to indicators of success or measures for what you were just saying? Oh, somebody added it. Oh, great, Megan, you were capturing. I tried, feel free to edit it. <laughs> I was typing as fast as I could. Thanks. So um, like, I want to uh, track the number of folks who kind of start off in any such Ex early exposure program, digital literacy program, and how many ultimately join one of our programs? There's a kind of like a conversion from interested in tech to joining a program with the intervention being the um, early exposure program. Are, are any of you working? Um, programs like that, earlier exposure programs or bridge programs. I know for Perscolis had a um, a bridge program for a while, Tech Bridge. Maybe the name changed at some point. At the at the Knowledge House, we are um, it's something that is very much a part of our DNA and and a part of the origin story. So, and we did run a program with um, Tech Talent Pipeline many years ago. Um, and we we currently do digital literacy trainings in the community. We're working on a partnership with Westchester to mm -hmm. really build that to partners in that area. Because um, there's just such a dearth of folks doing it. And, and I do find that we end up almost building from scratch. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think that should be the case. And I think it should be a shared um, activity that we do to just increase the funnel of folks who are interested in this type of, our type of program. Yeah, I know there's a lot going on inside the DOE too in, in New York thinking about there's been in the past few months, there's been like two or three different announcements between like future ready and 
some other thing and the apprenticeship thing, and there's a lot going on. Um, are any of you partnered on any of that work? We have a small pilot right now with something the DOE is already starting to scale, which is the year 13 programming, mm -hmm. which is creating a pathway, particularly. We're doing it sort of individually with a, with a school in the Bronx, Compsai High, um, who's actually part of this, uh, the general um, year 13 pilot with the DOE. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing that as, a, you know, I, I think it's it, it's definitely been interesting to and we, I think we've matriculated two of their students as, as part of our learners, and we've seen some good results. But it's still only two learners, so we're, we still don't know what we don't know in terms of um, what we need to make sure that high schoolers, you know, coming out of this uh, and going to workforce, what they need to really be successful. But um, yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah, based on what you're saying, um, Daniel, um, maybe, there's room here as a network to approach the DOA around that earlier exposure too, and getting involved in those other projects. I don't know, you know, each of you, I'm sure, have your capacity limits to do do earlier intervention work, um, but some good ideas there. Should we move on to another one? So I know the the people one always gets the most momentum. I wonder if we should. Oh, there's a lot of good stuff here. I was looking down at the other end and wondering if we should jump to systems, um, which is always harder. Megan, do you have a preference? Yeah, I think that makes sense because we can pick up where we left off. I can organize a little bit or we can organize a little bit in between our next session. Um, but yeah, I think the systems one is probably a good idea. Looking at time, maybe if we just chat for like a, a few, few minutes. minutes. Yeah, we could just get, capture your ideas and figure out how to kind of place that on here. If you have some ideas around systems change, um, I know a lot of organizations aren't used to measuring that uh, or capturing that or reporting on it. And jobs first, working as an intermediary and at a systems level, we're very intentional about capturing outcomes and impacts in this area, um, particularly because collaboration is. Uh, very costly in terms of time, your staff time and capacity, um, and that relates to what you need in resources to really collaborate effectively to improve a system. And so, if if one of your goals, this we didn't we didn't choose this, you did, you told us, and it's a great one, is to establish how skills based hiring results in equal or stronger candidates and employees. And I think some of you shared stories about hearing this anecdotally from employer partners, which is great. Uh, but if we were thinking about how to reach the proposed goal, there were three things we heard from you that we put on here before meeting, I think, or at least two of them, and maybe somebody added one, but um, a data set, data collection that cut across the network of like, what are we capturing as a network to, to prove that our, imp our impact um, collective outcomes track tracking, which are similar, and then qualitative data around employer feedback loops. So what might be potential indicators of success that say, yeah, our training is resulting in better employees or data that could measure that? I hate to say this because we're we're doing something like this in New York and it's uh, the bane of, a, of the existence of my recruiters, but we are doing a um, an RCT and we are comparing the outcomes long-term of those folks that go through our program and an identical population that doesn't get into the program, doesn't get even interviewed for the program and all things are equal. What are their career trajectories? What are their salaries, promotions, et cetera, for three years after when they would have completed the program? Uh, and the randomized control trial, it's it's hard to do. It's hard to get folks that are not accepted to these programs, but apples and apples, two people go through different programs. What are, what are the successes that we can measure? And what are we hoping to find? What do we think we're going to find when we get there? Yes. I understand the pain <laughs> of an RCT.
what might success look like um, if if we had the data, we collected the data. What is what what would be an indicator of that we were successful? With an RCT, with any any of it, you know, an RCT. If we were you know collecting data, what's going to tell us that we're succeeding in proving skills based hiring? results in equal or stronger candidates? I think the, the outcomes themselves, um, you know, in a, a comparison between those that went through a program like a Europe or any of the, sorry, for Scholas or Empower or Knowledge House or any of our program, so versus those that didn't, what were their outcomes at a certain point out? Um, and I think to be fair, it would be interesting to do a comparison of all types of people that fall into our demographics. So those that don't go to any program versus those that do go to college, um, you know, and just to be honest with ourselves about what the results are, I think it would be very fascinating to see. And I, my hunch is that um, depending on the industry, we would be probably, um, we, we'd probably have similar outcomes to some of the colleges. In fact, I think the one piece that's missing from some colleges is the workforce piece, which is why they're trying to work with organizations like ours. So you know how hard we hustle to get jobs for our, for our grads. Not every college does. In fact, most don't do that. Still very interesting to see what we consider an asset, like getting a four-year degree from a really good school in a subject like technology, versus doing something like a six month boot camp or training program, clearly not having the same skill set, but having the career readiness and most importantly, the network behind organizations like ours to that make those connections on our students and alumni behalf, there is a value add there that I don't think exists in most colleges. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, what we've actually heard stories from each of your programs through the years of you hearing things from employers. It, it may not be you specifically, other people who work there, um, that your candidates lasted longer or did better or were better at certain aspects of the work. Um, because I think, you know, our nonprofit training programs are including a set of essential skills, soft skills, I don't, you know, people call them different things um, that community colleges aren't necessarily including in their curriculum. So in, on that same train of thought, the just to, to bring it back here um, would be to look into the RCT and identify what is the common theme that makes these individuals stronger candidates and um, how, what, the why they are being retained longer. Um, and that, you know, going to what you just said, Carrie, it has a lot to do with the fact that you're not just one more person, you are a person when you're working with skill based um, training um, organizations. Um, the, the commitment to those, that individual success is attached to additional hol um, uh, holistic. Um, um, supportive services. It's not just only the placement and the training. It, it comes around with how do we connect you to the right resources? How do we connect you to, um, to being able to get to the job on time? How do we give you the skills, but also the resource? And I think that that overall, um, um, you know, a holistic approach to being served through the skill training, how are they measured in the end? Um, and I'm looking, I would love to seek and compare notes going back to the first thought um, that has been shared is if we, looking at these RCT results, how do we, what is the common theme that makes us stand out from in comparison with, with other um, service providers? Yeah, I mean, it's not an easy goal, right? But yes, great ideas. Um, I, I know we're getting close to time here. Thank you, um, Debbie, for that and everyone. And Diaslin, I know you mentioned you saw the jobs board on another one of these. I want to make sure we capture it in the right place. Where did you see it? I First saw page. The, I saw the alumni job um, board. Oh, this career alumni portal. career portal? Yeah. Okay, great. Not sure it's the same thing. Um, yeah. I think it could uh, also be used for current trainees. Yeah. Okay, but good. 
Um, what I wanted to say on that, um, there's this website called Built In NYC, um, and it's like a common spot where like tech companies place the jobs that they're looking for. And so that's become like a hub of for both like job seekers and for companies that are looking to get their name out there uh, to attract a uh, tech talent. And so that's what came to mind in terms of um, this like, accessible job board, right? Like it's it's like, it could be more of a, a, a community that's being formed. Great, and what did you say that's called? It's called Built In NYC. I'm gonna just type it. Okay, I got great. It in the, uh, I think I put it on the wrong page. I'm in Systemize Digitize a Network Referral System, but it's the sticky's in there. <laughs> okay. Um, Megan, I know you have need some time to close us out. So sorry, we went a lot, little long there, but I didn't want to stop good ideas. <laughs> no, never apologize. Thank you guys seriously for your, your participation and attention to this. It's really exciting to be putting some energy behind the goals and conversations that have happened in previous months. So I'm excited to see what, what we come up with as we forge ahead. I'm going to try to do this very quickly. Um, action items for the end of today were we'd like you to fill out a form to answer some questions about our next meeting date, as well as trying to find like a recurring time for our, our sessions as we move into two, 2023. Um, there's also um, a file upload in the form. We're working to update some of our network materials. So we just wanna make sure that we have a high res picture of all of your logos that we can include in our stuff. I just wanna make sure we have the most up-to-date version. So that's all in the feedback form. We had some tech trouble earlier, so if someone could open it and let me know that you can access the form, that would be really great. Thumbs up, I see one. All right, cool, thank you. Um, and lastly, we're gonna send a summary and I'll restate, the, we'll restate these action steps after the meeting. Um, so others who weren't able to attend can review what we accomplished. I blitzed through my action items. <laughs> Carrie, do you have anything to add before we say goodbye for the day? No, just thank you so much. I know we we put a lot out at you at the end of the day, right before the holidays, and you stuck with us and um, some really great ideas and thinking generated here. Uh, we one of the things Megan said is in the feedback form. We are looking to identify like a recurring meeting time once a month. So please just it'll take you maybe five minutes probably to fill, fill in that feedback form, and if you could just say hey, this is a good recurring monthly time for me. Uh, we'll try to figure out what works across the network if we can. Thank you, Carrie. And with that, we don't have anything else left for today. So we'll stick around in case anybody has any questions or one-to-one -one things they wanna break up. And other than that, thank you again for your time and attention. If you guys are celebrating a holiday, I hope you enjoy. And if not, I hope you find great relaxation ahead and we'll see you in the new year. It's my first time saying that. So I had to do it. <laughs> see you next year. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you. Have a good one. Happy holidays, everybody. Bye. Bye. Woohoo. <laughs> High fives. <laughs> they Thanks, Allison. Great job, guys. Yeah. yeah they they did great, well. great stuff in there. All yes. right, I'm going to hop off. I'll see yeah. You. See ya. I'm going to bio break since I needed to before we started. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs>